Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we invite you to join us for a conversation with Senator Connie Mack. Cornelius McGillicuddy III, popularly known as Connie Mack, is a Republican politician who served three terms in the U.S. House of Representatives between 1983 and 1988, and two terms in the U.S. Senate between 1989 and 2001, before announcing his retirement in 2000. In 1988, during remarks at a campaign fundraising luncheon, President Reagan said, you can count on Connie Mack to defend freedom, to defend America, to defend the taxpayer, and to defend the family. Throughout his service in both the House and Senate, Connie Mack supported the passage of legislation related to health care, financial modernization, modification of the tax code, and public housing reform. A cancer survivor, Senator Mack was a strong advocate for cancer research, early detection, and treatment, co-founding the Senate Cancer Coalition. Fun fact, his paternal grandfather was Connie Mack, former owner and manager of baseball's Philadelphia Athletics and member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Senator Mack joins us today to discuss his recent book, Citizen Mack, Politics and Honorable Calling, which former Vice President Dick Cheney calls an account of his spiritual journey, which is honest, humble, and explains much about the man and his life of service. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program, coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office, with Senator Connie Mack and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director John Highbush. Citizen Mack, Senator Mack, Connie Mack. Um, I, I read this book and I just tell you, it's a, it's a wonderful journey back in time and, and an incredible memoir. Thanks for writing it. And I, I know that everyone who tunes in to uh, all of our shows at the Reagan Foundation and Library are just going to love it. So congratulations for writing the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was fun to do. It was a great experience just to write it. Yeah, well, how? tell me how is Priscilla, your family, uh, tell me, I hope all the whole Mac family is doing well. Uh, thank you for asking about them. Yeah, we're all doing super. Um, Priscilla, uh, she's had some medical problems over the years. I mean, as we get uh, older, that happens to us, but she's come through them really extremely well. She's as strong as ever, uh, has that wonderful personality that she does. And the sure. kids are great. Uh, you know, our son, Connie, was in Washington for years. Uh, he just recently moved to Fort Lauderdale. So he's oh, back right. in Florida. Debbie's in uh, up in St. Pete in that area. The grandkids are great. Our great grandchildren are wonderful. So uh, the yeah. Lord has blessed us, and we're very pleased. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Um, so I want to go back and review history a little bit, um, and go to the time before you even ran um, for the your house seat. Um, I wonder if many people remember. Um, you were a banker. You were in the banking community in Florida, and that's essentially the platform that got you even interested in issue, community issues and, and running for office in the first place, right? Yeah, I was, you know, that, that's interesting, you know, a, a community banker, because I was not some banker out of New York or Atlanta. I was a community banker. You know, we had assets of, you know, maybe 60, 60 million dollars, you know, 100 million dollars. You know, we were small banks. We you were involved in your community, so you really got to know the concerns. Uh, when a person would come in and say they wanted to borrow some money, you ask them a few questions. You really learn about what they're experiencing. And clearly those days were very, very difficult for people. Uh, interest rates, uh, you know, we were we were actually paying six, 16% for certificates of deposit back in those days. So you can imagine what the rates, uh, you know, 18, 19, 20% being charged on on loans, mortgages were being made at 14%, something like that. 
I mean, inflation was out of control. I mean, there really was a there was a there was a loss of faith uh, in our country at that time, and a real concern about our future. And that's kind of you know those discussions uh, are one of the things that kind of led me uh, into my involvement in politics, but also uh, a very active Congress in the '70s with respect to financial regulation uh, just got me so angry. And I would come at home, you know, and I'd be complaining about it. And Priscilla would look at me and say, you know, Connie, either do something about it or shut up, you know. <laughs> so so yeah. that was a challenge I had to respond to. Sure, sure. Uh, and then, uh, and I really didn't, I have a faint memory of this, but I, I wasn't reminded of it until I read your book. But you had a brother named Michael who you, obviously were really close to, and um, when you were young, when he was young, um, something happened that, that really influenced your life. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very important um, aspect of my life. Um, I am one of eight children. Uh, the four oldest, uh, we were one each a year apart, and so my brother Dennis is a year younger than I am. My brother Michael was a couple of years younger than I am. And uh, we were very close uh, as, as boys growing up together. Uh, we went to uh, high school at, at the same high school. We went to college together. We were fraternity brothers. We were very, very close. I, I have deep admiration for all of my brothers and sisters. Mike, for some reason, just seemed to be special. Uh, he had a great sense of humor. He could walk into a, a piano bar and sit down and you know just start playing the piano and sing songs to people all around. He's the kind of person people love. He was incredible incredibly bright. Uh, my brother Dennis graduated from law school at the University of Florida, number two in his class with high with honors. Michael graduated number one in his class with high honors. Um, both very, very bright guys. Um, and so Michael was very special. And uh, uh, unfortunately, at a very young age, in his 20s, he was diagnosed with, with melanoma. And that melanoma was located on the, on, on the top of his head. And, and, and so that it was it was hidden from view and it grew and eventually grew to the point where it became malignant and uh, uh, here he is in his in his uh, final uh, year of law school it may have been his final semester of law school he has to have this what would appear to be was going to have a radical neck surgery which is a major major uh, in essence reconstruction of the, the side of the face it, it didn't turn out to be quite uh, that severe but the operation was very significant. He did not drop out of his of school. He continued and finished that, finished it on time, graduated with his other members and uh, and fought that cancer uh, for 12 years, which was almost unheard of for melanoma uh, back in those days. And in being with Michael, uh, those days, uh, uh, you notice the smile just came across my face. You might think well, you'd be in tears as opposed, but we had such wonderful times talking about life and uh, and how to deal with life, which led to, you know, kind of asking those questions about why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And that was a major, major influence. Um, it gave me a period of time of introspection to really ask those questions. And eventually, uh, with the, the thanks of a fellow by the name of, of Don Shank, a reverend of a church in, in uh, in Cape Coral, Florida, uh, I was doing some counseling with. He was also doing some work uh, for me in the bank. And uh, he kept encouraging me, kind of, you're such a wonderful person. You know, we all hear those kind of nice things about ourselves and we, you know, okay, all right, you know, you don't really take them seriously. You gotta, but he, he, he said it in, in such a way one time to me, I looked at him and said, Don, you know, what I hear you saying to me is the biggest sin a person can commit is the failure to use the talents that God has given you. And I am not kidding you, John. When I said that, I knew exactly what I had to do. I mean, exactly. And I must tell you, I was scared to death. Oh, I hate sure. to give speeches. <laughs> so I'm driving home and tears are coming down my eyes. Uh, I worried about, I, I, knew, I knew I had to run for the Congress. And I got home and I <laughs> was getting ready to go jogging. I put putting on my shoes, Priscilla came into the room. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm getting ready to go jogging. Uh, I said, um, what would you say if I told you I was going to run for the Congress? She said, great, go for it. 
<laughs> often of one, I have often wondered, suppose she had said, I don't think it's a good idea, you know, whether it really would have happened. But so Michael, you know, Michael's life and his death, you know, just had such an enormous impact uh, on me. And obviously yeah. still today, Mrs. Sure. Yeah, and it comes in, it just sings right through in the book. And I, I have a lot of, you know, empathy for you, that whole story, uh, you know, my own personal story. I, I fought a truly terminal cancer for five years and and think I've beat it. I, I hope I have. And it's uh, so when I read that your brother Michael had gone through that kind of a struggle for 12 years, it just really, you get a sense for, for the battle he had to fight and how it affected you. And, and, and the story you just told is, uh, it seems to me there was a calling. You heard a call. Um, right. Right. in that whole story right and that's a no question about it no question yeah yeah a neat neat story and i um his story affected you in two ways i think it led you to decide okay i'm i need to make a contribution to the community i'm going to run for congress but it also got you involved in the whole uh, the the issue of cancer and and where is there a cure and how can we fight this disease right it, it affected your career outside the Senate and and as well in the Senate right well that's a good point John I mean yes it ha I mean yes it, it changed my life both leading me into politics but it also led me into this effort of finding a cure for cancer it's just interesting before we started talking I just got off a call on an advisory board that I had set up for the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, which is a great, great institution. Um, and so, yes, my, my life uh, uh, you know, went down that path as well. I mean, and when I, I, when I ended up, and, and we'll probably get into other aspects of this, but when I ended up winning the Senate race, within uh, the first week after uh, the race was over, we sat down and talked about what are the things you're going to do when you're in the Senate? And one of the things that happens when a person goes from a two-year term to a six-year term is kind of like, wow, you have time to broaden your horizons a little bit and to become involved in more issues. And I remember Arthur Finkelstein asking me, well, what's the thing you really have passion about? And I said, I said, cancer, cancer research in particular. And from that moment on, uh, my life has been, you know, down that path uh, of, of trying to find dollars for research uh, and, and, you know, and having actually been chairman of the board of the Moffitt Cancer Center and for eight years, still on the advisory board today. So yes, that's sure. a whole new life opened up there as well. Yeah. I want to, I promise you, I want to get back to the uh, the subject of uh, Arthur Finkelstein, because I know how important he was in your political career, your life, and many people's lives. Uh, uh, but I, let's let's go to 1982. Um, you success. You had a success. You you never met with anything but success in each uh, each of your races. But you first won in '82, so you were on. <clears throat> you're a part of the Reagan Revolution. You're on the the front end, right? And you you enter the House in '82 along with uh, some other uh, major figures. One of them being John McCain, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And John became a dear friend. Uh, yeah. And John Kasich was another that came in that, that same uh, same time. But John and I, um, I, I nicknamed him Quick Draw McGraw, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, John could come at you with, with the guns a blazing, right? Uh, yeah. But he's a wonderful man. Um, I had a great admiration for him, very close over the years. We both ended up, uh, you know, we came in together into the House. He went to the Senate two years before I did. Came, I followed him into the Senate, and we spent, uh, you know, my 12 years in the Senate together. You know, we both had you know, really different approaches to, to you know, our, we had different personalities. We, yeah. I think each had great respect for, for the other. And it was a real tragedy when we lost him, but he was a great, great leader uh, for, the, for the country. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it was fun to see you, uh, the two of you work together and like you say, different styles, but, but much of the same philosophy, right? In fact, if I can, if I see if I remember, if I memorized it, you know, what was Connie Mack about? It was less taxes, less government, smaller government, uh, strong defense, and more freedom. Right? We, we came up with you know we came up with that uh, tagline, which you know some people just kind of discount as you know a throwaway line, but the reality is less taxing, less spending, less government, and more freedom. 
uh, you know, literally we would be in conversations about new pieces of legislation and ideas and, and, and someone, either me or someone in the staff would say, well, what does let's think this, this, what does that do with respect to less taxing or what does that do to That's spending? Right. What does it do to go, the growth of government? What does it do to, uh, to, to the importance of freedom? So it really became um, a test for us as to, you know, the things we said and the things we pursued. Yeah, sometimes a bumper sticker actually has real value, right? It, uh, it had meaning for you. Now, um, I knew about this particular group because I worked on the House side when you were there, um, but I bet you a lot of people in the, in the public don't, and that's this group that you were invited to join uh, very early on of, of, of members in the House um, uh, called the Conservative Opportunity Society, COS, right? And, I, I think I remember you all meeting every Wednesday morning, and uh, um, it was a tight group, uh, knit group of members. Tell me, how did that group influence your outlook in Congress and affect you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I wonder, John, if we could, you know, before I get into that question, let me just go back one step, because, again, this we are at the Reagan Library, and yeah. uh, I think it's important for for those of us who love Ronald Reagan, uh, to, to hear this story. So again, this is, ni- this is 1980, and I'm in that bank that, that we talked about earlier. Uh, and because of conversations with all those different people, the, the 1980 election became very, very important to me. I'd never, I mean, sure, I voted and all that kind of stuff before, but this one was just for some reason really, really focused. Uh, I, was a, I was a Democrat at the time, um, and so you've got Carter and Reagan running and I'm observing this and I kind of came to my own conclusion about what the race was all about. I mean, Jimmy Carter basically was telling us that we're going to have to learn to live with limits for the first time. You know, Americans are going to have to learn with limits that, uh, uh, we have limited resources and, and, and the answer to all of our problems is to bring into Washington a larger, wiser group of bureaucrats to make the decision of how to out, how to allocate limited resources. That was his perspective. Reagan, on the other hand, said, no, that's not the way it, it, it works. It, it, it works because of free markets, free enterprise, capitalism. Uh, that's what built America. That's what's going to make America great again. So, I mean, I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself, I hope America decides, you know, what the right answer is. So we're sitting there, Priscilla and I are sitting there watching the election that night. And I am blown away uh, with the victory that Ronald Reagan had in, in November of 1980. Uh, and not only that Reagan had, but also the, all of the Senate, new senators that came into the, into the U.S. Senate and the number of new House seats that were picked up by the Republicans. And I turned to Priscilla that night and I said, this is the most important thing that's happened. And somehow or another, I've got to become involved in it. That was two mm-hmm. years before. I, you know, I had no idea at that time that I would end up uh, running for running for office, but I I just had to get that story in because it's another one of those. <clears throat> in, I mean, Ronald Reagan inspired me. Uh, oh well, to, um, <clears throat> believe you me, um, I, I got some questions for you on on Ronald Reagan. Uh, so get ready. Um, uh, but but thank you for putting um, the President Reagan in the order he deserves in this conversation because your your point is, hey, he was one of the key reasons you decided to to go for it, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there I am now. And you asked about the Conservative Opportunity Society. And the first thing people might say, where in the world did you guys ever come up with a name like that? Yeah. And Newt Gingrich, Newt Gingrich was the, you know, the, the intellectual and the emotional and the, the physical power behind uh, this this organization. Um, uh, you know, a little caucus, if you will, within the Republican members of the House. Um, and he can't, you know, he said the reason we came up with this name is that there's the liberal welfare state. Or the Conservative Opportunity Society, conservative as opposed to liberal welfare, opportunity state and society, and that's that's how how we got this name. But this was a band of guys that got together and said we're tired of being in, in the minority. And one of the one of the difficulties that you have though is we had some great leaders, wonderful people. Um, so how do you how do you say you guys aren't doing enough? You know you're not being aggressive enough. Um, we, we don't want to hurt them, but we want to move. We want to move uh, the, the party forward, and uh, we had help from Jack Kemp and from Trent Lott, you know, and Dick Cheney. They were the younger members of the leadership, um, and we just basically 
identified a, a five different, I, I don't remember exactly which of those issues were, you know, like the balanced budget, the line item veto, the president's crime reform package, but five different items. And we set teams up, if you will, uh, to pursue each of those. And, and, then, and the teams had different components to it. One was kind of like the, the philosophical, the actual legislative uh, uh, action. But then there was also another group that kind of said, we have to help make this thing move forward. So we have to, we got to get speakers to come out and talk about these particular things. And we came up, you know, with uh, the, uh, we spoke uh, special orders, uh, they're called on, on, on the house side. And we would go out there and give speeches on the floor. And Tip O'Neill got so angry with us. I mean, he really did not like us. I mean, he did not like <laughs> us. Um, he referred, by the way, he referred to us as the three stooges and the three stooges he was, was Gingrich, Walker and Weber, I think. So I took, <laughs> I had this great picture of my grandfather uh, uh, playing baseball with the three stooges. <laughs> so I got, got that picture, had it signed, took it and, and gave it to Tip O'Neill. I think I got a chuckle at him, but he was still pretty hot under the collar. But it was a great <clears> group. And, and I think it was the beginning of changing uh, America uh, with respect to more conservative approach to, to government. Yeah, that was a classic uh, Newt Gingrich-style guerrilla activity from the backbenchers who found a lot of inventive ways to call attention to those issues and to start really making a difference, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah for example, uh, there was a fellow from Florida who was for the balanced budget uh, constitutional amendment. So we had this process where we would go down during the one minutes each day, and we would each person would get up and say, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm here today to Ask the uh, ask you to bring to the floor of the house uh, the, a bill for a balanced budget constitutional amendment. Of course, we immediately get overruled. They wouldn't bring it to the floor. But one day, one day, the only Democrat on the floor was this poor fellow from from Florida uh, who was who says he was for the balanced budget constitutional amendment, but he had to stand up and object to our bringing. So <laughs> it was a little difficult for him to go back home and say, hey, I'm for the balanced budget. But yeah, didn't you just, uh... so anyway, we did all kinds of things to kind of push our agenda forward. Yeah, and then you had a, um, a really neat idea, and I remember this at the time, uh, and it's something I think that really helped introduce you to the broader conference to get better known and to Get some start to get some attention uh, upon yourself, and uh, and that was when you circulated a very important letter uh, that that dealt with the subject important Ronald Reagan, uh, and it was all about tax cuts. So tell us about that. Well, again, I, I, I've I have thought about that uh, uh, many times over the years. How something very 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 simple had such a major impact on on that particular uh, debate about the third year of President Reagan's tax cut. Uh, so this is 1983. Uh, I've just been sworn in. Uh, a, a major um, issue for uh, ma major the majority leader, uh, Jim Wright, was to eliminate the third year of, the, of Reagan's tax cut. One of my staff folks, um, it could have been David Blee, could have been, well, anyway, uh, it, it, you know, said, you know, Congressman, we, we think you want to go down and get a 143 signatures on this letter saying that if the Congress passes legislation to repeal the third year of the tax cut and Ronald Reagan vetoes it, we are committed to sustaining that veto. And so here I am, a new member. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know what I was doing, frankly, other than these guys said it was a good idea. I said, okay. So I went down to the <laughs> floor and I'd walk around and I'd get these. And sure enough, we, we you know, we got we got enough signatures, and there's an interesting part of the story about John Kasich, who's a dear friend. But John came up to me, very young, young fellow, was just old enough to get into the Congress, had been in the state legislature, so he knew a little bit more about politics than I did. And he came up, sat beside me, and he said, Connie, um, I think you're really, you're really wasting your time. I mean, you're, why are you spending all this time doing this insignificant thing? So anyway, fast forward, you know, a couple of weeks later, we're at this huge event for President Reagan, big fundraiser and everything, thousands and thousands of people. And Pre President Reagan gives up, gives his speech, and he reaches in his pocket, pulls out this letter that he's received from Congressman Connie Mack that they saved the third year of his tax cut. How pleased he was. <laughs> <laughs> so John Casey came up to me not long after that and said, I will never, ever give you political advice again. <laughs> but it was, you... It, it, 
it, you it must have been great. beaming. I, I, I think if I recall, that might have been at the House Senate dinner, uh, uh, you know, with, so. like you say, with thousands of, uh, of supporters, right? Right, right, absolutely. It, it, yeah, that brings back some really uh, fond memories. But, but the, again, the point, though, in all of that is how, you know, a very simple thing. And this is not, you know, headline kind of activity. This is, you know, you look at a problem. Uh, fortunately, my staff had a great idea. I was naive enough to think, okay, we can do something <laughs> about this. Went down there and got it done, and it made a difference. Yeah. And it did. It, 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 it is what uh, uh, a Newt came up to me afterwards because I didn't know who Newt was. And I'm not, that's, that's wrong. I, didn't, I met Newt when, when I first uh, began learning how to campaign. They had the campaign school back in those days. I don't know whether sure. he's still there. Um, but he said, hey, I, I noticed what you did on that letter. That's a great thing. I said, there are a few of us that are get together talking about how we're going to change Western civilization. You know, and uh, some people hear that that phrase or that term and they think, ah, that, you know, it, that's though that's what we were engaged in changing western civilization saving it for freedom um yeah. and and i was invited to join the group and i have, haven't regretted that at all no no it's a great story uh and i think in your first term you were placed right on the budget committee or it was at the or that was your assignment right and you write in the book uh tell this story i just loved it uh you know, you start to get educated and you start attending these briefings with Weinberger and others, and they start talking about planes you can't even see, <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, yeah, you're right. So here I am, a brand new member of the Congress. And I mean, listen, you know, you, if you've never been involved in politics before and spent almost uh, no time in Washington, you have these images about what's going on up there. And, you know, you, you think after you see some of the legislation, you wonder, what are these people thinking? I mean, this is crazy. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I, I own the budget. I'm on the budget committee and the budget committee. Uh, the, one of the first hearings we have is with the secretary of defense, uh, Cap Weimerger. And so before the, the that uh, hearing would take place, the, the morning of that hearing, he invites the, the, the committee out to the Pentagon, has a breakfast. He talks to everybody and and I'm sitting there as a new member, and I'm I'm listening to these guys talking about this this plane that they couldn't see. And I, I'm thinking to myself, oh, you know, I was right. These people are nuts. I mean, they're talking about that plane, <laughs> planes you can't see. <laughs> and then 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 uh, um, uh, the cruise missiles that you couldn't see. And I'm thinking, boy, this is really. And it, but then as the discussion went on, you know, it, it started to make a little sense to me. And then I put two or two together that it was it was the early days of the of the stealth fighter. But it was it was it was one of those fun experiences to to, to go through that. Sure, sure. Uh, now tell us about the very first time you met President Reagan. Uh, I, I I bet you it was a, a typical kind of photo op. Um, that's usually how a freshman member would get to see the president. But is that the case? And did you spend 30 seconds with him or 10 minutes? How, how, do, how was, tell us about that. Yeah, you're, you're right. It was a, tip, a typical situation. I mean, uh, uh, the party uh, uh, knows how helpful being seen with the president for a candidate is. Um, so I had just, I guess I had just, yeah, I would have won the runoff election. So I was now the Republican nominee for the congressional seat, invited to Washington to meet with the president. And of course, but it was a very, a very simple thing. You know, you, 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 you're lined up with, with the other guys in the same position and uh, you, you have a staged um, um, area in which you go up, you shake hands with the president, a few, a few lines back and forth and, you know, off you go. But for, for a, a novice in politics uh, to find himself standing in the White House uh, with the president of the United States, uh, it's a, you know, it's just an incredible experience. Um, and obviously many other opportunities over the years, but that was the first one. And you always remember that. And uh, I was looking around my room to see whether I actually had, a, had that picture here, but it's, it's indel indelibly marked in my brain. Sure. <clears throat> so you're in the house for the remainder of the Reagan presidency from 82 through 88. Tell us about Ronald Reagan. Um, you, you got to spend more time with him, um, and you certainly were on the front lines in the Reagan revolution fighting for what he believed in. But uh, just for our audience, here, here I have right with me today somebody that got into Congress thinking about Ronald Reagan and served alongside him. Tell us about him. Well, you know, he was, 
he was a larger than life figure. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, this is this is a person that when I was with him, I just uh, I just so admired the man. I mean, I mean, really, uh, it's it's it, it's hard to say how impressed uh, impressive uh, that uh, that he was. It, his his ability to engage you immediately drew you in. Uh, he had a personality that was just that was wonderful, but. Um, and he he always made you feel so comfortable being in his presence. Um, of course, he, he you know he he every everything he believed it seemed like I believed. I mean, it was just one of those things that just absolutely uh, matched. Whether it was economic policy, whether it was foreign policy, which as you know, uh, during the Reagan years was an extremely difficult period of time. Uh, yes. The MX missile, the B one bomber. Uh, you know, uh, the, the um, um, uh, intermediate range missiles in Europe, the riots around the world. Uh, it was not easy to stand up and, and, and say, I am for Ronald Reagan, except we had Ronald Reagan hmm. who could communicate with the American people uh, in such a straightforward way and make things so understandable uh, that in the end we won. But it was a very, 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 very difficult fight. I remember the debate about the quote nuclear freeze issue back in those days. I think we lost the vote on the floor of the House. I think it was probably a resolution as opposed to any specific piece of legislation. But we really won the debate around the country. I mean, it really, it, it, after that, it just that whole issue just kind of fell away. So, you know, President Reagan was, was a, 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 an incredible leader. Uh, to see him represent America overseas, I mean, it just was, it was regal. I mean, I guess that's a, a word that almost comes to my mind. He's regal. Um, this person is a uh, quick story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Priscilla and I are flying down to, he's doing an event for me in, in, uh, in, in 88 for the Senate race. Uh, and uh, we're told how to, where we're supposed to stand when we get, you know, as we're waiting to get off the plane, you know, that they tell us the president will go out first, you know, then Congressman, you'll go out, then your wife will come out after you. We're waiting there. The resident, uh, the president comes out of his cabin, starts engaging conversation with us, and and says to Priscilla, "Now, uh, after you, Priscilla," <laughs> and Priscilla being Priscilla, she said, uh, "Mr. President, uh, I can't do that. But your folks said that you're supposed to go out first. <laughs> and the president says, looks at her and says, "Now you know, Priscilla, I'm president of the United States, and I can do anything I want. So you're <laughs> going to go out first. <laughs> I mean, he was just, he was just a very, very special man. But yeah, you know, uh, his he was he was committed to his ideas, and that's what you know that's what that's what made following him so easy. Sure, sure. Well, you know, it works both ways too. You were uh, I, I just no doubt that President Reagan admired you um, so much so that uh, you know you talk about when he came down to Florida in support of your sent your first Senate run. Um, he, he, in doing so, he somewhat violated the, you know, Republican principles in the sense of, uh, he, he selected, he looked at you and said, I want that guy in the primary and, and endorsed you, which was a rare moment, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cause there was still, we were still involved in a, in a primary. Uh, and so it was a, it was a big deal, even though it was kind of downplayed. I mean, he, I mean, downplayed in the sense of the, the, the press was trying to figure all of this out. Uh, but there's no question about he didn't downplay. He was there to support my candidacy for for the Senate. Uh, and, and a story about that. Uh, I remember I was asked, um, you know, White House reached out to my office and said, you know, would uh, the congressman like to introduce uh, President Reagan? And I said, I'd love to. One condition. I write what I'm going to say. I don't have to. You know, you guys aren't going to write it. I'm going to write it. And it was one of those, you know, one of those little short moments uh, of, of a speech or a, a speaking moment. Um, but it's one of those that touched my heart deeply introducing him. Um, and I told him about a story when I was in in France and uh, I did a little town meeting in one of the out, in little countries, I mean, uh, uh, communities outside of, of Paris, let's say, um, an agriculture community. And, and at the end of this little back and forth where I was answering questions from the French audience, I asked my host if it would be all right if I were to ask a question uh, of them. And what I said was, tell me what you think of America. Now, this is 1985, probably. 
and you get a lot of different answers, but then one fellow stood up, uh, probably in his 80s, um, with a cane to kind of stabilize himself. And he looked at me and he said, you tell the people in America, you tell them, we will never forget that it was the American GI that liberated our little town. Tell them we will never forget. Wow. And I use that little uh, story to tell the president. So, Mr. President, we want you to know we will never forget that you are the person who led America back to greatness, that you rebuilt yeah. our military, you rebuilt our economy, you reduced inflation, you got the economy going again, you created jobs. We will never forget. And he looked at me afterwards and he kind of took me by the shoulders and he said, who's here to help who? <laughs> anyway, it was, it, it was a wonderful time with him. Wonderful time. Yeah, I what a moment. Um, OK, so you you spoke about what you wrote to um, introduce the president. Uh, one of the advantages I have in this conversation is we literally, I'm sitting right now on top of 66 million documents from the Reagan administration. And in it, I found the remarks that Ronald Reagan wrote in support of Connie Mack. You can count on Connie Mack to defend freedom, to defend America, to defend the taxpayer, and to defend the family. He supports the strategic defense initiative that would protect us from nuclear attack. And he supports tough federal judges who would put violent criminals behind bars. And to protect our children from the menace of illegal drugs, he favors the toughest, most comprehensive drug enforcement policies. Yes, Connie Mack cares about people. That must have been pretty special to, to, to hear the President of the United States say that. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's special to hear it again. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, he, he meant everything to me. He really did. One other point about President Reagan, that first Senate race was tight. Uh, it was touch and go uh, day after election, a few days after election. Very small margin. And um, I think your campaign, thinking mathematically you'd won it, but also feeling like we had better get out there and state very definitively that you did win it in order to ensure there was momentum. And, and, um, and I didn't realize this. Actually, I knew it. I forgot it. But Ronald Reagan uh, called in uh, to your press conference. Um, uh, tell us about that story, because it's really important. Well, I mean, you, you, you've outlined it pretty well. I mean, the, uh, I went to bed on uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, 2.30, uh, 25,000 votes behind. Actually thought we had lost the race. Um, uh, three hours later, after tossing and turning, uh, you know, I, I, I saw that, oh, this thing was narrowed down to 5,000 or so uh, absentee ballots. We could win this. And sure enough, by the end of the day, Mitch Bainwall, a friend of yours, Mitch was uh, uh, yeah. my uh, campaign chairman at the time. And he, had, you know, Mitch had done all his calculations. And sure enough, he, he said, he said, Connie, you're going to win this race by 38,000 votes or something, 34,000 votes. Right? And I said, Mitch, you're out of your mind. You know, it's not going to you know, that's, that's exactly that's basically what we won by. So, um, but it took eight days. So, so here you've got um, uh, the day after the election. Uh, it's now, now starting to look like we've won. The absentee ballots have, have come in. We're ahead by quite a, you know, thirty thousand votes, but we're being challenged by uh, uh, by my opponent. Um, and like you said, what we wanted to do is to hold this press conference and basically say, uh, "I declare victory." And while it's still being debated in the press and all that kind of stuff, but we declare victory. Um, and President Reagan was gracious enough to call in to that uh, press conference. So we had President Reagan on the speaker and he just called to congratulate, said, Connie, congratulations on this great victory. It was important for you to win the state of Florida and so forth. So, I mean, it really validated. I mean, that, that was the point. He really validated the, the point of view that I had won the election, even though it hadn't you know, been finalized yet. And it, and it makes all the difference in the world to get to that position as opposed to fighting to get back, get to it. Yeah, yeah it was a wonderful sure. moment. Oh, yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, Arthur Finkelstein previous to this, but you also just mentioned uh, just such a terrific fellow, Mitch Bainwall, who I know was your <clears throat> campaign, cha campaign chairman, chief of staff. Um, 
guys like Mitch are really um, special people that really drive the success for the Connie Max of the world, right? I mean, um, uh, Mitch, is, Mitch is one of the smartest guys that I've known. Um, and we hired Mitch uh, in when I was in the house side to do budget work. He was working at the Office of Management and Budget. I think he was in his mid to late 20s at the time. Um, looked very young and you kind of wonder yourself, come on, does he really have all that? I mean, really, really bright, bright young man. He went to Florida to set up a foundation for me that we did some work in, in, around the state, then became the campaign manager, then became my chief of staff. And uh, of course he and Arthur Finkelstein had this incredibly close relationship. Uh, and I really got to the point where, I mean, I looked to Arthur and to Mitch and, and Mitch more on a day-to-day -day basis. I had to have the confidence in Mitch that he knew what he was doing. And uh, it was a tough, tough, tough race. Um, but the team pulled it off, uh, uh, and and, uh, and and yeah, Mitch was Mitch was, is an important part of my life, and and I, I feel blessed to have had him as part of my team. Mark Mills was another guy that was a terrific uh, player in that in that campaign. Yeah, um, well, don't forget the candidate had to be a little bit involved in the success as well. So <laughs> well, that's that's true, but it takes a team. It really does. <laughs> it really does. Uh, you know, I uh, let's. I'd like to talk about uh, Arthur Finkelstein for just a minute or two because I, how important of a role he played in your political career, or your life. Uh, and I, I first I have to just say, as a as a devotee, as a fan, as a uh, a, a really um, an enormous admirer of Arthur, uh, I uh, thank you for choosing to thank him and speak about him in the very last words of your book. I just, to close out the book with uh, a memory and a mention of him, I'm sure is very special to all those that worked for you in your career um, uh, and who knew Arthur and worked with him in one way, shape, or form. Tell us about Arthur. Well, let's first of all kind of start at the end uh, in the sense that uh, Arthur became almost uh, a part of our family. I mean, we, we developed such a close relationship. And as you know, my son, Connie, uh, was in the Congress for, I think, eight years. And uh, Arthur was uh, uh, Connie's uh, political consultant as well. And Connie and Arthur became dear, dear friends. So it, it, there's there's a great uh, loving relationship uh, about Arthur Finkelstein, my family. Um, so uh, uh, how did Arthur, Ar Arthur got to us really kind of serendipity. I mean, we had a list of, of holsters back in 1982 to, to, to take a look at the and the second or third call was to Arthur, and Arthur uh, said, "Well, I don't, I'm I'm not employed by anybody in that race now." And so, in, in essence, said, "The first person that offers me a job, I'm taking." Yeah. And so we said, but th there was another little element to it: is that Arthur is a huge baseball fan. Yeah. And and so the name Connie Mack meant something to him, and sure. he was intrigued by that. Um, and so that's how the relationship got started. Um, and so he 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 provided the polling and the advice during the first uh, that first campaign in eighty two, uh, in eighty four I didn't have anybody running against me and and uh, my AA at the time brought a new person in from as a political consultant and frankly things, you know it's pretty hard to lose a race when you don't have anybody running against you but we we did it pretty poorly we we lost <laughs> we lost some credibility in the way we handled that, um, and so then Arthur. Arthur's back on the team, and uh, you know, I, I, it, it, there's no question in my mind, John, that I, that I would not have won the Senate race. In fact, I could go back maybe even to eighty, the eighty-two race, and I'll mention that in a minute. I I could not have won the race for the Senate in 1988 without Arthur's help, and um, the, the help. Is, you know, people think of pollsters is the guy that look at numbers and you know they tell you this, and they tell you that. Arthur's real strength was his understanding of what what's behind those numbers yeah what do those numbers mean how do they interact how do those how do those groups of people that in this pot over here with these numbers relate to these people over here i mean he and he, he had such an understanding of human nature i mean he just knew how people were going to respond to stuff uh and he understood the press he understood how they would react to certain things so he he was invaluable, and you're right. He did an amazing, amazing uh, job. I'm, I'm thinking. I ought to be careful about this, but I'm, I'm thinking about 
see if I, I can't find a way to have someone write a book about Arthur, because I think one of the things that the left does real well, they really lionize their people. We have a tendency to kind of take everything for granted. You know, you move on to your next thing in life. Arthur is one of those unique individuals that came along um, that really uh, understood American politics. He understood the press. He understood uh, human relations. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful guy. So, yeah. I mean, we can we can develop a couple of those stories as, as to why I've said those things, if you'd like to. But well, I, I just just know when you uh, when you make your next project, uh, writing, uh, getting a terrific book written about him, you let me know how I can help because uh, I'll add a few paragraphs. Uh, just a genius and a, an incredible human being. Okay, so last point about Arthur before we move on. Um, kind of ironic and tragic, was it not, that uh, for us all to learn, I don't know, over a couple of years ago, that cancer ends up taking Arthur Finkelstein from us, right? What a, yeah. I bet you you took that particularly hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, as I, I've already explained the relationship that we had, and then for cancer to be the issue, and uh, uh, it, it just... Uh, I, I I don't think there's there's several times a, a week I will think about Arthur and say ah I, I, boy, I wish I could just pick up the phone and call him and get it, get his insight but as a dear friend uh, you know we 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 were just brokenhearted about it uh, not just me but Priscilla and Connie and the whole family it was just a terrible terrible loss and of course he did he died like he did everything else he he, he died a a uh, a man very comfortable with who he is and who he was. And yeah. uh, he reached out to everybody, closed the doors on lots of things, uh, made us all feel comfortable. He took the initiative to do that. Um, and so and then a very, very special, uh, special point uh, about him. Just uh, a great, great person. Yeah. 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 We're all better off as a result of knowing him. So uh, in Florida, in, in those days, we had primaries and if you didn't win the primaries by 50 percent plus one we had runoff elections i won my primary no problem the democrats had a whole bunch of people in their primary uh it came down to two people buddy mckay and bill gunter bill gunter was absolutely was con everybody was convinced bill gunter was going to be the person who's going to be the nominee and he's going to win this race uh arthur does a poll the day after their um uh, their pri uh, their primary and he and he comes back to me and he says Connie he said let me two things There's two things came out of this poll one is McKay's going to win not Gunner and McKay's going to come out of there with a huge momentum and with that momentum nobody knows who he is that and that or to say it a different way liberals thought he was liberal moderate thought he was moderate conservatives mm -hmm. thought he was conservative perfect position you know he's in. He says, the only way we can win this race, you've got to get involved in their runoff election. Of course, my, my reaction, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not going, what do you mean get involved in there? No, no, no. He says, no, no, no. Here, here's the way we would do it. So he came up with this, um, he came up with this commercial. Uh, and it, it, as, as you know, but the, 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 the kind of the tag was, hey, buddy, you're liberal. And the, episode, yeah. that, the, the race came down to, I was an ideological wacko. Uh, he, was, he was an extreme liberal. Um, so we, 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 we uh, he created this ad. It was 10 seconds long. It said, uh, Buddy McKay has, has uh, raised uh, your taxes um, six times, and now he wants to raise his pay. Hey, buddy, you're liberal. And that's all it was. And, and we ran it in, in, in a couple of markets up in North Florida, and I went over to Tallahassee at a press conference and introduced this uh, to the press. And they just went crazy about it. What are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, why why are you attacking McKay? And, and I said, well, we'll get to we'll get to Gunter later. But you know, it's, it, I just want to make it clear about what and what Arthur was really saying is, once their um, runoff election is over, there's only 30 days left in the campaign, and 30 days was not enough. You got to you got to you're going to have to tell people who you think this he is, and um, it, we have to get started now. And of course, we did that, and that's what I meant earlier. If we hadn't done that, uh, it, it was over. It was over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some really unconventional but genius thinking, right? I just uh, and, yeah. and you were smart enough to follow it, and courageous enough to follow it. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah, Zig Ziglar yeah, had a yeah. term for that: intelligent ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> you knew enough to know you didn't know. You better pay attention to somebody who does. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, if we had fifty hours, we could cover your successful uh, two terms in the Senate, your Senate career. Uh, but we don't. But I, I do want to uh, mention one thing and just have you talk to us about it. Um, I don't know. Maybe a lot of people don't know this, but um, you had served to, because of your outstanding career, your persona, your success in Florida, the fact that you represented the state of Florida, you um, were asked not just to be on a short list uh, for uh, George uh, Bush 43's uh, vice president, but to be his vice presidential uh, ca uh, candidate. And yet you turned it down. Just a, a, amazing. That, that's got to be a one in 10 million type of a story. Tell me why. Um. Well, uh, so it's kind of a long story. I mean, uh, the first came from uh, from Dick Cheney uh, asking me to uh, uh, to uh, I guess probably at that time it was to be on the list, and I I said you know I I really don't want to do it, and, and there were multiple conversations that uh, that took place which led to the, the point that you were making, and the last of which was at a fundraiser up in Orlando, and I'm face to face with George W. and you know, he does that standard where he takes you by the shoulders and says, Bonnie, I, you know, I want you, blah, 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 you know. And I said, I'm not going to do it. And uh, he said, well, you're one tough SOB. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's so that's how that's how we got to that. So why did I not do it? In 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 1970, gosh, it seems like seems like now we're talking about, you know, centuries ago, 1970, yeah. no, 1996. Yeah. Uh, 1996, um, uh, Senator Dole had put me on uh, his short list, and it got down to uh, where it was either me or um, um, uh, Jack Kemp. Yeah. And you know, Jack and I are dear friends, and 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 uh, uh, he was great to serve with. But anyway, so it's the two of us. And and Bob, I had a couple of other conversations with him because naturally we've seen each other day in and day out on the on the Senate floor and all the work that we're doing. Um, he says, now, uh, there's one thing. He said, I, I, I will call you at, at some point and ask you definitively, if I were to ask you uh, to run, would you do it? And so that we kind of left that. And sure enough, you know, a week or two or whatever later, uh, he called. And I had to say, yes, I'll do it or no, I won't. And and I will tell you, John, I was terrified about doing it. I mean, I really was. It just, to me, it just seemed like, oh, it's just beyond your capabilities, blah, 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 blah. But I said, I said, yes, I will do this. And so I told Bob that. And fortunately, he made the decision to pick <laughs> Jack Kemp and not me. Uh, but but what I think what happened, having gone through that experience of really having to decide, because what if you if you say yes to running as vice president, you have to have in your mind that one day you're going to have a chance to run for president. Um, and so I thought all that through. And the conclusion I came to was that's just not for me. I mean, I, I, I'm not one of these guys that got into politics uh, thinking that I'm doing this because I want to be president of the United States. You know, a lot of the guys end up in Washington and yeah. men and women these days who end up in Washington to, to believe that. Uh, they are going to be president of the United States someday. I was never there. And um, so uh, before uh, George W. reached out to me, there were a lot of, I mean, a lot of, it was a couple of years uh, uh, go by. And I, at that point, have, make, have made the decision that I am retiring from politics, that I'm not going to run for re-election in 2000. So I already had gone through the, 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 the mental process of making that decision, deciding I'm, it's time for me to step out and go do something else with my life, and that, and and I stuck with that. I mean, I it, and I think I really think that's the right decision. But I will tell you, uh, having gone through the writing of the book and the interviews and the very you know conversations I've gotten into with people, you know, you kind of think, well, you know, maybe I should have, but but no, I am I'm very comfortable. I I made the right decision. Yeah, um, 
you know, you know, I say this jokingly, but you know, yeah, maybe in some respects it was a smart decision because you would have had to have gone up against Barack Obama uh, when you were. <laughs> right. I thought about that too. <laughs> and when Arthur, and, and I would tell you back to Arthur's minute, as soon as Arthur, as soon as Arthur saw the momentum uh, building for Obama, he, months and months before the, uh, the the Democrat primary, he said, "It's all over. This guy's going to be the nominee, and he's yeah. going to win." Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about how politics has changed, if you feel it has, since your time in the Senate and, and where we sit today. Yeah. I, well, you know, um, I guess there's, there's a couple of different answers to that. Uh, yes, it's really changed. And uh, no, it really hasn't. Uh -huh. And what I, what I mean by that is human nature is human nature. And the way we treat each other, the way we react to each other is fundamental, basic human nature. And if you go back through history, uh, I mean, uh, Hamilton got shot by Aaron Burr. Uh, you know that that's pretty that's pretty ruthless politics. Um, but <laughs> but but, there's, but you know so politics has always been uh, this very confrontational um, uh, process. Um, so that element is still still part of it. Okay, um, there may be some modifications to that, and there's a, there's an ebb and flow to how things work. But the reality is that. Human nature is human nature, and that's that's at play. The the other thing, that, so that's where I can say no, it really hasn't changed. But yes, it really has changed in the sense that the technologies that are available to campaign these days, and 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 what all those technologies uh, really engulf people. They, they, you you live in a bubble that's created uh, by these technologies, uh, who are very cleverly manipulating what you're thinking, what you're seeing, what you're hearing. You know, we spend all this effort and time trying to make sure the Russians aren't coming. But uh, the reality is we have our own internal organizations, both political and, um, and corporate, uh, that are engaged in manipulating people's uh, uh, thinking. And so uh, there's a, there's a uh, uh, on Netflix, it's called The Social Dilemma. If you haven't seen it, I really would encourage you and everybody else to see it because it gives you an insight about how this manipulation takes place. And it's important in a free society that we get our, uh, a handle on uh, how this is working. Because the biggest concern I have now, John, is people don't know what, they don't know whether the information that they've got and they're acting on is true. I mean, there's just, it's, it, you just, it, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. And that's, that's part of what is causing uh, this, 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 this conflict, this uh, confrontation is taking place. It's real, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a result of the technology. Yeah, and, and meanwhile, um, you still uh, titled, um, subtitled your book, uh, Politics, an Honorable Profession. Calling. Um, <laughs> an honorable calling. And I, don't, I, know, know, that, I, I don't know the reason that I say that is because um, it's only an honorable profession, depending on how the politician lives the life of a politician. It is an honorable calling, but uh, some don't do as well as others in holding up that end of a. Anyway, uh, excuse me for. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Thank you for correcting me. I, I, I was looking at your book. And I thought, yeah, a calling, and and uh, that is what it was for you, a, a, a calling. A friend of mine Go asked ahead. me, said, "What, what's the, what's the title of the book again?" And I, you know, I said, it's, it, it's "Citizen Mac." Uh, a politics, an honorable calling, and he looked at me without batting an eye, and he said, "Oh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a novel, huh? A fiction." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Well, would you, somebody in their mid twenties who's thinking about getting into it like you did in this day and age, would you uh, advise them to, to get into politics? Absolutely, absolutely, I would. I'm, 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 I'm still optimistic about the future of America. Uh, I'm optimistic about uh, uh, the, the, our values of freedom, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's just Im important that younger people get involved uh, in in the election process. And a lot of people will say to me, "Well, how? You know, wh we're going to we're going to have a hard time finding candidates." Uh, and I, I I don't I don't know that there's ever been a time in which there weren't a lot of candidates for office. Uh, so the answer is good people. Uh, with the proper motivations, need to get involved in politics. They can make a difference. Um, it's tough, but 
Absolutely. And I, and, and, and I guess they, when they ask me that question, they kind of say to me, oh, no, they're not going to do it. Why? Or what's the motivation? It's a very simple thing. And I remember in, in, the, in the speech I put together back for the 1982 campaign, there was a line in there that said something like, I believe in and I love my country. Now, that might sound like a, you know, oh, come on. I mean, that's a little, a little fruity, isn't it? I mean, I believe in and love my country. 1982, don't forget, very tough times patriotically. I mean, you were kind of looked at as, but, 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 that's, but that really was the point. It, the point was, I, I do believe in and I do love my country. It was, it's that sense of responsibility, duty, whatever one wants to call it, that, you, that I got involved and that other people get involved too. So if you, have, if you have the calling, let's just make sure that the calling is the right thing, that you're there for the right reasons, to help other people uh, and to protect our country uh, in, in, in the future. Yeah. What a great way to end a, a, a great conversation with a, an absolutely great guy. Uh, you are uh, uh, one of my heroes, uh, Senator, and I know I've many, many, or millions of others who feel the very same way. So to have you write a memoir and to put all this down in one place, uh, it's a special thing. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for for writing it and for all the contributions you've made to this country over the years. And so it, it really has been wonderful to see you and talk to you. Well, John, thank you so much. It's, it's really great that, uh, that that we've done this. And I, 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 I admire you for the position that you're in. I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be like dying and going to heaven. I mean, you know, uh, to be working in an organization uh, that is there to foster the ideas uh, of, of a man we both love so much, Ronald Reagan, uh, it's got to be very special. And you've done a great job there. Very proud of you. And I appreciate this opportunity so much. Great. Thank you so much, Senator. Great to be with you today. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends, and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.